Okay, uh, topics. Um, uh, uh, what topics do people have to talk about? Um, so we have some conversation on frozen intrinsics from Node. Uh, okay. And we also have a alteration coming up for Tofu. Okay, great. Those both sound central to what we're doing. Um, for frozen intrinsics, we did land the flag for the command line. Uh, when you fired it up, it will freeze the JavaScript uh, intrinsics. It does not freeze Node's core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, provided functionality. Mm -hmm. um, we've already gotten reports of people saying they can't run their code if they turn it on. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat expected. Uh, yep. they, it's all apparently the override mistake also expected. <laughs> um, uh, do um, you, d uh, so Salesforce, uh, um, uh, specifically used my weird accessor hack on, f if I remember correctly, on exactly four objects. On object prototype, um, uh, function prototype, no, no, not function prototype, error prototype. Uh, um, I'm sorry, the only two I remember are, func are object and, er and uh, error, but there were two more where it was coming up. And what they found was that by doing the accessor trick over there to, to suppress the override mistake, uh, that they were getting very, very few remaining failures. Um, we could look at doing that. Um, that might be a little bit of a harder sell to get through core since it'll change uh, property descriptors depending upon uh, more than just configurability. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think that it's not a barrier to adoption to leave uh, the, the override mistake pane in there, uh, I'm certainly happy to, to um, uh, not work around it. Um, obviously, we'd all be better off if we could actually get it fixed in the spec. Um, uh, but um, failing that, if, if Node proceeds to, you know, if this thing gets some adoption, and people are failing specifically because of the override mistake, then they'll fix, then, you know, th that will start a process where they, will, where they will feel the pressure to fix those few cases in their code, which is good. Um, yeah, so we do have some fairly large libraries that don't work, uh, namely Express, which mm -hmm. is probably the biggest HTTP library for Node. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't heard back on the possibility of changing things, in Express's source code, but we did have some people objecting to requiring Express update their source code. We had an interesting comment where somebody even suggested uh, not having the same object model as JavaScript slightly. Uh, V8 quickly shot that down. Well, so by, by, what was the change to the object model? They wanted something different than simply um, uh, um, we tr you know, undoing the override mistake? Not really, no. That, okay. That's really all they want. Okay. But doing so, we cannot get through web browsers after that usage counter. There's mm -hmm. just not a chance anymore. Right. Um, okay, so uh, from my perspective, uh, either um, uh, hacking those four objects that Salesforce identified or not, uh, either way is fine with regard to all of my goals. Uh, I prefer not doing the hack if that results in uh, pressure on the ecosystem that's, that eventually causes people to not fail under the override mistake. That would be, that would be an awesome outcome. Um, we could probably update a decent number of these. The actual error problems are not super common. Um, they're for very specific kinds of people trying to emulate uh, polyfills or uh, doing metaprogramming of some nature. Mm -hmm. um, the place where I would expect it most often, this is not based on any experience or measurement, 
uh, is overriding object.prototype.toString, overriding that by assignment? Uh, actually, the one in Express is them adding a dot bind property to a random function literal. Oh, wow. Um, uh, <laughs> in, in, in which case, if I remember the Salesforce situation correctly, and I don't know that I do, um, uh, if function.prototype is not among them, uh, that would still fail under that set of choices. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, so that's about the update there. Uh, I don't think we're going to change anything, but we do have some people wondering if we should just not ship the flag due to the breakage. So we may want people to either comment that it is useful, even if it is problematic. Um, uh, where should I comment that it is useful? Uh, I can put a link. One second. Uh, JD, can you uh, comment on the, um, um, uh, the, what the four objects are um, uh, that uh, Salesforce uses the accessor trick? I do not know. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I haven't, haven't seen that code yet. So. Okay. Um, so I'm going to look, though. Okay. Uh, we plan, by the way, to, uh, in our SES shim, uh, the, the Agoric SES shim, not yet reconciled with the Salesforce one, uh, but we plan to adopt exactly the same four objects, um, uh, do the same clue in, in ours because um, uh, the extra breakage uh, doesn't really buy us anything from, with regard to our goals. Hi, Mark. This is Manuel also from Salesforce. And, uh, like JD, also fairly new to the team, but I'm looking at the code that we have where we're doing uh, some fixes for the override mistake, and I see only object prototype and array prototype being patched. Okay, array prototype. So you don't see error prototype? I don't see error prototype. I only see object prototype and array prototype. Now, okay. I, may be, I may be, again, uh, I'm maybe not looking at the whole perspective of the code, but you know, I, I found the source code where we're doing this... Uh, I would expect, yeah, I would expect it all to be in the same place. Um, error prototype. Okay. You're saying, you're saying you expect also error prototype? Yes. Uh, specifically. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Yes, I see. Okay, let me correct myself. Object prototype, array prototype, function prototype, generator prototype, async function prototype, async generator prototype, error prototype. You know, there's a bunch. You know, I can. I can. I make. Yeah. If you could, if you could actually uh, send. Uh, the the complete list because at, at uh, with the you know we okay. want to reconcile our assess with yours and we so we want to use exactly the same list and the list that you just enumerated seems fine to me. Perfect. Let me let me uh, gather and paste into the chat the list. Okay. Great. Thanks. So the other thing in that thread was uh, from a V8 engineer questioning what value does freezing the intrinsics get you over uh, the get originals proposal? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we should explain in simple terms uh, the difference of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, I will need to stop laughing before I can explain that. Um, um, in particular, there was an interesting I think undercurrent, at least in other discussions about Git originals providing um, guarantees. The new Git originals proposal is no longer a set of functions on a namespace. Instead, it is a set of module identifiers uh, to get the original. Um, I did not know that. So I think this is actually an okay approach uh, without yes. alteration. Uh, so Dominic is also proposing import maps. Uh, do his import maps um, uh, enable one to remap the module names by which one would get originals? Uh, correct, yes, they do, but not in a programmatic way. Um, okay. So it requires a uh, hosting uh, 
shell of some kind, such as a command line argument would be expected. For HTML, it's a separate kind of uh, script tag that doesn't evaluate code. It just modifies how code is loaded. Yeah. Um, OK, well, that's very interesting, because that means that um, I mean, one could one could obviously um, provide um, some kind of API um, uh, for setting the import map, and it's actually good that they're not providing it because there's a authority issue there. You you, you know until you have the kind of um, uh, system versus user mode uh, distinction that SES gives us. I mean, this is, this is really the same issue as the system object, which Dominic also resists, um, is that anything that could modify the import map is clearly privileged over uh, anything that's within the world that was manipulated by that modification. Yes. Um, so there is some tension there, actually, about uh, those still requiring that level of authority of knowing um, if you're getting a shimmed version or not, which the intent of Git Originals is to allow the ability to enforce that you get the originals. Um, well, if Dominic is allowing them to be remapped, then he's already compromised that principle. Uh, well, it's two different proposals. I don't think they are cohesive when brought together. Okay. Um, I mean, but they're both from Dominic. They are largely led by Dominic, yes. OK. Uh, we should probably bring this up somewhere. In particular, these are reserving the STD protocol uh, for built-ins like the other proposed web built-ins. So, um, at committee, we have not had great success discussing uh, built-in modules, but as the web goes forward, they will be shipping built-in modules regardless, and they will not be doing it under a uh, web-specific namespace. It'll just be under STD. Well, so as far as I'm concerned, STD now is a, a web-specific namespace. And any built-in modules provided by the JavaScript language need to be in a different namespace. Uh, that's perfectly viable. Um, so that's it for frozen intrinsics. OK. Unless anybody else has concerns. Uh, the follow-up past frozen intrinsics was going to be an attempt to freeze core. Um, I'm currently not working on that. Uh, if somebody else wants to look into that, they can. Uh, but there is a very, very, very large amount of user land modules that mutate nodes core in non-trivial ways. So that would be um, very breaking to turn that on. Mm -hmm. So we should probably work through the frozen intrinsics and state that breaking code is OK for the uh, benefit. So, so as far as the SES goal, goals are concerned, um, uh, just freezing the JavaScript intrinsics is what we need. Uh, we don't need. Um, uh, uh, core frozen because we consider core to be well, in our new terminology. We consider core to be um, resources rather than um, uh, pure shared uh, objects anyway. Uh, so they would need to be um, uh, attenuated and um, and virtualized uh, as they get provided um, uh, by more trusted code to less trusted code. Uh, part of the problem with this is right now core can expose almost every part of core from anything you import. Um, I, did not, I, I so, did not understand that. So if you were to import, let's say, um, util, you could actually get access to FS. If you import the genuine util, but you wouldn't give guest code the genuine util, you give it some yes. attenuation of util. That would require a very large membrane over util, but yes. Well, I think that I, I don't think there's any other choice. And freezing FS and freezing util doesn't help. Uh, maybe. Uh, so if that doesn't seem like something anybody 
feels the need to do right now, we can just push it off, um, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything that's sort of inherently giving access to, um, uh, you know, to cause effects or to sense effects in the, in the outside world, which node core certainly does, um, the, um, uh, that, that, that has to go through um, attenuation um, on the way. And the problem with, with the existing node API is you're right that it's a difficult API to attenuate. Uh, and um, I think that's just a, a constraint we have to live with. Um, and I don't, think, I don't think freezing really does much to, to, to help that. Um, we also had a request to open up a PR about fixing promise instances having a dot domain own property. Uh, rudimentary looks, doesn't look like we'll break anything if we move it to a getter setter with a weak map or something, but we haven't made a PR. Um, okay. I don't really have the energy to try to push that through. Okay. Uh, uh, state, state it again, please. I want to make sure I got it. So there is a feature of Node called domains. These are analogous to what was proposed to TC39 called zones. Uh, they are an async context uh, that propagates over multiple turns of the event loop. Uh, when a promise is created within a domain, it is assigned a own property called dot domain that uh, roughly gives you access to all sorts of things. Um, since it is an own property, it isn't really able to be intercepted when these things are created. Yes. Um, so the idea, I think it was two meetings ago, was to move it from an own property to a getter setter pair. Which is deletable. Uh, yes. Okay. On the promise prototype. Okay. Um, I think it's doable. Um, I think a weak map internally to, to associate the state with the instance. A weak map or private slot, either one works, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so, that seems doable. Uh, I haven't made a PR for it, but if somebody makes a PR, uh, it would be nice to go forward with that. Um, so that's it for all of Node business I had, unless somebody else has business. Um, so with regard to um, uh, Bradley's um, uh, search for volunteers to uh, actually do that PR. Uh, do we have any volunteers? Well, okay. Um, uh, uh, this will be important to Agoric, uh, and we are about to um, uh, grow our size. Um, uh, so uh, there might very well be a volunteer coming from our side. Uh, I actually just wanted to question because I was not listening half of the discussion uh, with the, with walking dogs and everything. Um, sorry, can, can can you clarify what what the PR would would like like the scope of the PR? Um, so in the domain code, uh, promise creation handler uh, for Node, you would move from creating a own property. Uh, called dot domain on promise creation instead to be assigning to a weak map or private symbol, either one. And uh, that would be about it. And then altering promise prototype to have a getter setter pair for this dot domain uh, field. Right. And then the, the uh, getter setter pair on promise prototype could be removable and the SES, and it would not appear on the SES whitelist. So initializing an SES environment would remove it. Correct. 
and if and um, only user mode depends on the public property. Any system mode use of domain would make use of the internal access rather than the public property. Uh, I don't think any internal use of this exists except to propagate it because it does not always exist. Okay, great, great. So we can so so as far as we're concerned, we can just remove it. Uh, yes, it might break some code that deals with domains, but domains have been deprecated since I think 2012. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're going to, you know, the, the, the frozen intrinsics is going to break more code than this anyway. Uh, I would assume so, yes. Yeah. Do, so do you have a sense yet of how much existing node code is not broken uh, with frozen intrinsics? Uh, kind of, you know, intuitive, you know, sense of what the ratio is? The ratio is pretty small. The problem is a lot of uh, frameworks that try to do intelligent things uh, tend to be where it goes wrong, and those are the more popular frameworks. Um, okay. Usually, they're easily fixed. Uh, okay. So we'll is see. Because of the override mistake, or because they're trying to patch the the intrinsics. Uh, usually, it's the override mistake. We do have people trying to patch nodes core a lot, but not intrinsics very often. I, okay. There's a very large number of things that modify nodes core. Okay, okay, this is, this is very good news. Um, per modifying the intrinsics, there's some fairly popular things that do modify intrinsics, but they're not too many of them. And they're things that I don't know if you even wish to support like mutating error stacks. <laughs> Definitely do not wish to support that. Um, yeah, so that I, I, I think it's doable. I think uh, there will be large pushback because a lot of applications will break, even if libraries themselves do not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but but it's a switch that um, is default off, and you have to turn it on to get this this breaking behavior. Correct. Okay. Good. Good. One of the things that a use case that um, we designed uh, the CES proposal and the CES shim uh, uh, to accommodate. Uh, was uh, uh, running trusted shims that do modify the primordials before freezing the primordials. Um, uh, and that's more, you know, more compelling for the browser than for Node, because for, in Node, you have the, um, uh, the person running the, the code has much more control over what version of Node it's running on. Uh, but for the browser, uh, being able to shim it up to a given version before freezing it and creating the, the, um, uh, the shared secure environment uh, did seem like, um, uh, did seem important enough that we didn't have, um, uh, didn't have the realm born frozen. We had the realm uh, born unfrozen. Uh, you run the registered shims and then after the registered shims are run, then you freeze. Uh, does any of that, um, uh, if you're not hitting that as an adoption barrier, the, the inability to shim before freezing, um, uh, I would not uh, bother then um, uh, because uh, it's, you know, it's a trickier mechanism. And uh, we thought it through under the assumption that needing to shim is, uh, you know, would be necessary. Uh, I don't think we've had enough time for feedback. Okay. Seems like if you have to work out the machinery to do it for the browser, just simply incorporating the same machinery in Node would be less of a big deal. Um, I think one of the you know, one of the shimming common uses for shimming is uh, to uh, 
accommodate uh, language spec evolution prior to uh, complete implementation by the by the engine implementers, and I don't see that being any less of a concern in Node than in the browser. Uh, probably there's a lot more stable stuff in in Node that that you know it 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 works in whatever version it works in, and anybody who's trying to work in a future version is doing experimental stuff, and so um, you know it's less of a big deal in that sense, but. For the people who are pushing uh, forward into the future, there are going to be a small uh, uh, fraction of the user base, but they're probably an important fraction to support. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's hard for us to add uh, those flags. It just probably won't be a programmatic API, similar to the constraints on import maps and loaders. Um, I don't think it would be done via a loader, though. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, so we're not right now. We're we're because the sesh shim uh, does not yet support loaders. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're registering the uh, trusted shims as strings to be evaluated. But that's clearly a hack. It's not. That's that's not the way to um, do the shims in a way that you can promote. Um, is there a problem if we use URLs or paths? Data yeah. URLs are possible. Data URLs. Um, so, I mean, the data URL is, I mean, there's no, it, it's not, it doesn't create a danger that's not created by strings. Uh, but it also doesn't create a benefit over strings. You might as well just have this, I mean, the data URL to be used, you have to decode it into the string anyway. Yes. Uh, um, so the big thing for at least the policies that we've had very few complaints about, but I think very little usage, is they are URL based. Uh, a couple meetings ago, I also did mention that uh, I opened up to the security working group the possibility of adding data URLs and HTTPS URLs to what we're allowed to import and was asking for feedback there. I haven't seen any complaints about them outside of some uh, cache consistency issues for data URLs. So, I mean, from the SES perspective, it's important to um, that you know, that confined computation is really born confined and only has access to the outside world that's explicitly granted. Um, uh, so in particular, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the dereferencing of a module specifier into module source code is something that's somehow provided through the framework of customizing the the module fetch behavior and we, that we as we've talked about, um, and so as long as the as all of this fits into that general complete interception and none of it creates a problem where things are going to try to go out to the web in a non-interceptable way. Um, but um, I mean, in general. Uh, the I don't want URLs to become part of the JavaScript language. We succeeded at um, essentially keeping them out of the language and just talk about specifier strings and leaving it up to the environment to uh, provide the uh, means by which um, uh, the default means by which specifier strings are dereferenced into source code. So whatever we do uh, should be possible to make interceptable. Um, I don't think we have to mandate it to be a URL, but those would likely be common. Um, we've had discussions about a, uh, well, there's two topics here. 
Uh, one is layered APIs are now having fallback specifiers within string specifiers for browsers. Yes. And then, uh, so that's a little bit complicated if we do not sync with them and have the exact same mechanism there, even if it's not URLs uh, with the pipe character. Uh, and then for arbitrary strings within there that are not uh, URLs, they're paths or uh, bare names of some kind. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember the use of syntax or, you know, spe and specifically the pipe character. Uh, I thought that the fallback was done with an array of specifiers. Uh, no, so in side layered APIs under the proposals, when you import, uh, all browser imports are transformed into URLs. Um, when you perform an import, the layered APIs propose if the import string contains a pipe character, it is treated as an array of fallbacks split on that pipe character. I see. So even so, uh, there, so 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 some kind of recognized syntax bleeds into lam into language concepts, even if we um, don't recognize the URLs as URLs. We have to say that the characters that appear within any one specifier, that those characters cannot have an unescaped pipe. Uh, under the layered APIs proposal, yes. Okay, that sure sucks. Um, the alternative is a language modification, which Dominic has been increasingly reluctant to do just because of how difficult it is to even speak about built-in modules. Okay. So, um, there's the pipe character, which we probably do need to respect in the future when we're talking about these things. Mm -hmm. um, Does the proposal include a way to escape the pipe character? Percent encoding works. Okay. Okay. Which, so so, so that, that gets to a point where it's crafted with an awareness of URIs, even though there's no imposition or, or no, no forcing them to be URIs. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Um, the percent encoding, uh, there's no there's no way to specify percent encoding that does not recognize a URI that just says in the string you can percent encode. Uh, and it will percent decode it before I, interpreting it as a specifier string. There's no way to do that and have it actually do the right thing for URIs because URIs only accept the percent encoding at particular places. In particular, you can't percent encode the, um, uh, the protocol name and probably can't percent encode the colon. Um, right. Right. Uh, and, oh, and probably if you percent encode even a slash, then it's not taken to be a path separator, it's taken to be a slash as part of the name. So I don't know enough about this, but not all specifiers on the web with import maps are full URLs. They do allow bare names, like if you just wanted to import Lodash, and there's something uh, with Lodash hyphen ES, so you would percent encode the hyphen there, potentially, I don't know what that behavior would be. Okay. And that's because the, there's a desire to have them relative to some other location? Yes. Okay. Right, which is, which is also the reason, um, I remember now at one of the meetings that I was saying very strongly they should be careful um, about how to identify namespaces because that first colon following an, an initial sequence of alphanumerics is very important if it is to be potentially interpreted as a URI. Mm -hmm. the, the, the set of all possible schemes uh, is not fixed. It can change over time. 
So if you have like STD colon um, key value, then that is a potential collision if STD is ever introduced as a, a URI scheme. Yeah, I mean, I suppose another way to look at it is by choosing the name, you have introduced STD as a URI protocol. Correct. Right, but, if, but only in the context of, of ECMAScript. So it's really bad if then someone else wants to use it for something, for some other purpose. If you register it, you're fine. So if, uh, does, IN, does IANA register these strings? They do, yeah. yes. Okay. It's actually very trivial to get one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think STD might actually be difficult to get though. Uh, I believe... What, so what if the policy was that, that neither JavaScript nor the browser could standardize a protocol name unless they also register it with the IANA? I, I very much like that. Okay. Um, I don't Will the IANA play ball with that if lots of people start doing it? Yes. Um, they let Node just grab stuff whenever we want it. I think it would be about the same. Okay. Um, uh, I would not expect um, there to be any problem on the browser or JavaScript uh, 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 side of you know, the, the standardization process if there's no significant resistance on the IA, IANA side. So I think, I think maybe this is a, a winner. And then we just say that specifiers actually do have URI syntax with URI decoding rules. Uh, unless they're these special host specific bear names, I guess, maybe. So bear names are, no, I suppose they're not. What are the rules for relative URIs? Uh, relative URI strings begin with a forward slash, a, a period forward slash, or period period forward slash. Okay. Well, there, there's another family that begins just with a path segment, which is essentially any character at all. Correct. But those are not called relative. They're called like relative with no base. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something, I, I want to say it's like, it's the difference between a URI and a URI reference. Well, it says, um, quote, it says, quote, URI, you, you get the same experience in a service worker, uh, in the service worker API, like, uh, the URLs you get are scoped to a particular base, uh, the scope of the service worker, um, and the, you, you could drop the leading part and it becomes relative to just like when you have a base on a on a document, like an HTML document, um, you could start to refer to relative URLs without the leading slash, except um, that only doesn't apply for module specifiers. Wait, so so I'm sorry. So so in HTML, you can have a bare name uh, in an href field, and it will be dereferenced relative to something. To the base yes. tag and the header, yes, that that definitely has been you know uh, ever since. Like yep. it's always been there. Okay. Uh, it doesn't apply to uh, in, uh, static imports, and I don't believe it applies to dynamic imports. Um, they don't honor the base tag. Correct, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, so, uh, what it says is. If the URL is in a parser state of cannot be a base URL, um, if that flag is set, uh, that's what is used for uh, the module loading mechanisms for everything. Um, so WASM, JavaScript, hmm. all that. Okay. Um, so rolling, rolling back time a little bit. Um, so we do have those 
import maps going on. Um, for Node, I have old outdated documents on adding resource uh, interception APIs. Um, until we find a solution to the isolation problem for loaders, I don't have a path forward for those APIs either. So, so, so when you say, um, uh, so we've talked about, uh, um, uh, you know, solutions in these meetings. Um, uh, 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 so, um, so I just want to understand the until better, because you know, certainly we have work to do, but is, is, is that the work that it's the until or something else? Uh, well, the things we've discussed so far, we cannot implement due to either lack of hooks or uh, just simply um, we, we don't want the garbage to stay alive for the entire lifetime of a realm. Oh, 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 the garbage collection issue. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. That was a, that was a real issue. Um, the, Is the stuff garbage? I've read so far on distributed garbage collectors require some hooks into garbage collection, allowing categorization of groups of objects. Yeah, which we do not have. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that the is that the the hardest blocker? Is the garbage collection issue? I would say yes. Okay. Okay. There's a performance issue, uh, but eh, if you're if what you're is the performance, of the I'm cost sorry. of spinning up a realm is not tiny. Uh, an isolated realm is around 10 milliseconds. To okay. Spin but, um, uh, so uh, if it's an SES realm, then pretty then pretty much you only need to spin up one of them, because then you do everything else within comp uh, in compartments within it. In theory, yes. Uh, we do have that outstanding TC39 issue that got uh, pushback from lack of browser interest, though, on that. Uh, is there a lack of browser interest in what? Uh, allowing realms to share intrinsics, which is uh, that that's the, um, we have not pushed that to the point where any pushback at this point should be taken seriously. I would agree, but we just need to push on that. Is what I'm saying. Yes. Okay, we do need to push on that. Yeah. Is anybody there's a TC39 meeting coming up? Um, uh, does anybody? Um, uh, have any, um, expect to be doing anything at that meeting that would uh, be of interest in this group? Okay, I have uh, two, um, well, three, three things. Um, uh, uh, one is um, the whole issue about the system, well, the thing that was originally the system object, which is more generally uh, the issue of having the platform provide a uh, whitelist of, uh, of which globals are pure. Um, so um, that's the, the, the new, less stressful form of the system object, less stressful in the sense of more adoptable. Um, uh, uh, the, because of resistance from Google uh, to the idea of introducing the system object as a namespace. So instead of introducing one global, they're instead uh, going down a path where you introduce, where every new resource uh, introduces its own new global. So a new uh, weak map constructor, I'm sorry, not weak map, weak ref constructor, um, a new finalization group uh, global, a uh, new um, uh, uh, get stack global, uh, and then uh, for these globals that are resources that are inherently resources and should not be part of a, a safe environment, um, uh, of, of a pure environment, uh, that we would have a purity whitelist that the resources would not appear on uh, so that a SES-like mechanism uh, any SES-like mechanism could consult the whitelist so that an old mechanism could know for new abstractions created after the old mechanism was written, uh, which things were allegedly pure or not. Um, 
the um, I expect there to be a fight specifically with regard to allowing weak refs to go forward, not blocked on that issue. Um, and um, uh, I am, uh, I my inclination um, uh, is to allow it to go forward. And I wanted to talk that out with this group and give everyone here a chance to convince me not to allow it to go forward. Um, uh, but the reason why I'm thinking of allowing it to go forward without this safeguard that I've always previously asked for is that hopefully we are winding down rapidly uh, in introducing whole new abstractions by introducing new globals into JavaScript. And we're going to shift to introducing new built-in modules. Um, there has to be some built-in module that goes first uh, that, that pays the cost of being the forcing function on built-in modules. Uh, I expect that will be um, a moment. Um, but in any case, uh, if we do get the distinction in built-in modules, which is the one that is worth fighting for, then we basically have a fixed whitelist for the stragglers on new globals that happened uh, before built-in modules. And it's a whitelist, which means that if new globals do get, if new pure globals do get added after that, the mechanism fails safe. Uh, it, we fail to, white, you know, old code, since the, if the whitelist is in user code, old code fails to whitelist new pure things, um, uh, but the result is it treats them as provided by the host like, they, like it does with window or document or, or nor, node core, uh, rather than, um, than including them in the language. Um, that sounds plausible to me. Uh, it's, it's interesting that the, the thing that makes the whitelist acceptable um, is also the thing that makes it kind of pointless, but um, okay. Okay, um, the um, so the uh, so so that's one topic. It sounds like nobody here um, wants to stop me from um, accepting that compromise. So I will I will expect to do that. Um, another one is the import expression. Um, uh, it is now the case that uh, that realms and SES and all of its variants and shims. Uh, realistically have to do something for module code. Uh, for the shims, we have to do it by rewriting. We've talked in this meetings about how we're actually planning to do that. Um, but uh, a Realms API or, or SES API that only traffics in evaluable strings is, not, is no longer a linguistic surface to present to normal programmers. Um, therefore, any such mechanism has to deal with, imp with import statements. Um, uh, any mechanism that deals that, that once you've built up the mechanism to deal with import statements, uh, my hypothesis right now, for which please put back, push back on this if this hypothesis is too optimistic, is that once you've built up the mechanism to deal with import statements, you've got all the mechanism you need to deal with import expressions. And therefore, um, uh, there's no reason to prevent import expressions from going forward to stage four. And, and, but, but, you know, but keep in mind that the stakes on this are high because stage four is really strongly irreversible. Um, but uh, they wanted it to go to stage four at the previous meeting um, I asked for a delay of one meeting so we could explore the issue. That was a lot of, um, uh, uh, and, we, and, you know, and we did explore a lot of module issues, including my trying to engineer a rewrite that was adequate for running modules on top of the shim. Uh, so I don't see a problem with it. Does anybody else see a problem with it? And did anybody else spot any assumption I was making that seems over-optimistic? Can I, can I, echo some of that back to see if I understand 
rather yeah. not really echo it back, but just try to capture some understanding that I have. Yeah. Issue is that once you've admitted a construct that can't be dealt with sort of parsing, okay, well, you've already signed up to do parsing. So, you know, what's the cost of, you know, uh, you know, marginally more parsing or more, or rather the, the, um, uh, you know, you, you, you've already, you know, paid the ticket. So might as well. Right. Is that, is that right. the general idea? Yeah. That, well, that's the idea on the shim side. Right. And then the idea on the spec side is also that um, uh, the realm spec uh, and inherited by the suspect will be providing uh, import hooks and the import hooks will clearly hook the import expression um, and, um, right. and, right. and and anything that's, and, and clearly, even if they're divided up between two different classes for, for other reasons, because of, you know, where scripts get evaluated versus where modules get evaluated, the nature of the hook would be the same. Um, so once you've provided the mechanism for hooking imports, then again, you just use the same mechanism in both places. Right. So something which has been floated uh, various times in the past, and I think there's a, I suspect there is a general appetite for, but everybody's been shy because it's a huge, huge, huge big deal uh, that would take years and years of effort of somebody, is to actually incorporate um, uh, uh, parser access into the language API, where you had a standard AST and, uh, um, and you could just ask the engine itself to parse things and give you back the parse tree, uh, which, I, which, would, which would be helpful here, but certainly proposing that is not, it would not be helpful here because obviously this, this wants to, to, to go immediately and that would be several years down the line at a minimum. Um, but I kind of wonder about it because this meta issue keeps coming up over and over again. That, yep. oh, well, we'd like to ensure this property or check that thing, but oh, we can't really do that without parsing, and parsing is fraught. Um, and, and I'm just wondering if the, the AST proposal ought to be lurking somewhere in our grander agenda. So there is an AST proposal. Uh, that is languishing. Uh, it's by Shu, um, uh, and it's uh, the clever thing about it. Um, uh, I say clever because of my purposes. The straightforward thing about it, from their purposes, uh, is that it's not proposed to serve the purpose of being a programmatic uh, AST for purposes of inspecting or manipulating code. Uh, the purpose for which it's being introduced is to have a significantly more compact way of conveying code from the server to the browser uh, and, a, uh, and a way in which the browser can ingest code that is uh, faster. Um, so that's, a, that's an AST combined with a, a serialization proposal for the AST. That it was, in fact, it's only a proposal for a serialized AST. I see. And the reason that I'm hopeful about it uh, is that no matter how much one says it is not designed to provide uh, programmatic access to parse trees, were it to come into existence, it would certainly be used for that. And the AST that they in fact designed for this purpose is actually pleasant for programmatic access. It's not the ideal a API for programmatic access, but I've seen APIs designed for programmatic access to, AP to ASTs that are worse than this. Okay. It's actually perfectly fine. Uh, it just, uh, what it, it's just that somebody needs to write, what, somebody would have to write a wrapper that e either unserializes it into a tree of objects or just creates a surface API so that you can view the serialized form as if it's a tree of objects. Uh, and that's very easy to do because they have a very straightforward encoding. Right. Well, presumably the encoding is straightforward 
precisely because it's designed to be rapidly and efficiently ingested uh, by by an engine having received it. Yeah. But uh, my sense from Shu is is that uh, uh, um, there is not a mo there is not momentum to push it forward. I think I don't remember why it is that Shu felt he was blocked on pushing that one forward. Okay. All right. Minor minor diversion, but just seemed relevant. Okay. Who of us is going to be expects to be in Berlin for TC thirty nine? Me. I cannot. I, yeah, I'm definitely not going to be there. And has Bradley already dropped off? It looks like he has. Bradley left a chat message saying that he was uh, ah. said, be back in a while. Oh, okay. Okay. And um, yeah. Um, uh, Manuel, are you uh, planning to participate in TC39? Uh, I don't know yet, Mark. I'm just, you know, getting acquainted with everybody here and everything going on. So I would love to at some point do that. Uh, I, at this point, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ready, I think. Okay. I will be remote. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the reasons I'm asking is that uh, last meeting, uh, Adam Klein, um, raise the issue of the degree to which the desire for a secure subset should constrain uh, uh, proposals for the uh, insecure overall language. Um, and um, so I went ahead and put an, an hour long item on the schedule uh, to discuss that. Um, uh, obviously, everybody here knows my position on that. Um, the, uh, so I just I wanted to, to uh, mention that and encourage people um, uh, to, to weigh in on that. Is that the third thing when you said there were three things? Yes, that was the third thing. Um, I, my, my, my primary concern there is um, uh, that the, the Oh, Berlin meeting may not be the best place to have that discussion. Yes. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, I've, I'd forgotten. That's the critical thing. Dean brought that up as well. Uh, he's correct. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, remove it from the agenda. I have completely forgotten about this. Thanks for reminding me. I'm going to remove it to, for the, from the agenda. And if it comes up, uh, I'm going to um, uh, uh, say that propose that we discuss at the next meeting and too many of the people who are interested cannot make it to Berlin and that's a perfectly good reason. Not okay, very good because I'm very interested in that discussion, obviously, and um, uh, Yeah, okay, good. Good. So um, if uh, nobody has any topics. Uh, I think we should go ahead and adjourn. Uh, Mark, um, uh, do you have some time afterwards, uh, briefly? Uh, sure. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop recording, and then. Um,